And indeed, we're going to talk about the open source software licenses, business models. I'll also cover uh, a bit of uh, open source uh, history. But before that, I wanted to maybe say, why am I talking uh, about, uh, about this? Uh, right, so at uh, uh, Percona, uh, we release uh, all our software as an uh, open source and we have, uh, and while we are focused on open source databases, ourselves, uh, uh, we are very much uh, focused and passionate about the open source uh, software in, uh, in general. Uh, uh, and uh, I have been uh, now in the uh, open source ecosystem for uh, about uh, 20 years, uh, looking how things uh, unfold, uh, change for better, uh, worse, and uh, so on and so forth, right? And I think I have seen a lot of things being kind of uh, successful and uh, uh, not so successful. And that is what I am going to share with you today. So we'll start with some, uh, uh, some history of the open source uh, software, which I think many people do not uh, really uh, recognize their open source uh, really uh, come from and really how old uh, it is. Now, if you re go in the early days of the, uh, the computing and, and uh, computers, the hardware and software were bundled, right? Because there, where all the whole hardware was so dispersed and different and unique, the software was really written specifically to work for uh, that uh, hardware and uh, was not really useful uh, outside of it. The source code was uh, shipped with that uh, early uh, software also because a lot of the uh, early computers were used by early adopters and those really wanted to modify the code themselves to fix bugs and maybe you know add functionality which they need and also because many of those early adopters were in an uh, academia space like university uh, so, uh, a lot were uh, shared in that space uh, according to the academic principle of uh, sharing uh, knowledge. Then uh, the 17 comes, uh, and uh, uh, in uh, this case, uh, we see uh, what software and the hardware get uh, unbundled. Some of that is coming from the uh, antitrust uh, lawsuit what, uh, uh, was against the IBM. Uh, at that time, which kind of uh, you know, forced them to uh, do something to uh, kind of break their monopoly, uh, essentially, right, and uh, have a more le a level playing field for uh, for our competition. Another interesting thing which was happening at that time is what computer software becomes copyrightable item. Uh, right now, it is kind of strange to imagine anything else because uh, software is a, such a major class of intellectual property for uh, many, you know, darlings, right? Imagine Apple or Amazon or Facebook, right? Without uh, copyright for uh, their uh, software as an, uh, as an IP, right? But really before that, uh, uh, that time, the computer software was not a uh, copyrightable item, right? So, uh, uh, because only you know selected list of uh, items were uh, copyrightable, and as uh, software was added to that uh, list, when we essentially uh, have a the multi-billion-dollar, uh, maybe you know trillion-dollar plus uh, uh, by now, uh, software industry was uh, created. As I see things moving forward. Uh, uh, in 80s and 90s, I will call that an era of mm, uh, romantic open source and uh, uh, free uh, software, right? This is uh, Richard Stallman, uh, one of the champions uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, that era. And that was, I think, a lot based on the uh, sort of, uh, you know, romantic view of how open source software can change the world 
uh, right? If you uh, hear, uh, maybe may heard a quote from Linus Torvalds from about the same time who was talking about why he created Linux. Well, just for fun, right? Uh, other people may be talking, hey, you know what? We just had our own itch to scratch and that's how we create open source software and uh, so on and so forth, right? So at that time, the open source was uh, relatively niche and was not really looked at as a major uh, mainstream, right? And a major business. Now, if you look at uh, uh, 2000s, we see really rise of uh, open source, uh, not exactly at the same of domination it is right now, but as a serious player. And we can see that recognized by Microsoft at that time where Steve Ballmer was uh, calling uh, Linux a cancer, uh, right? Or comparing uh, Linux uh, to cancer at that time. And I really like this quote uh, in particular because uh, it's also a great illustration of, about how things change with time, right? You can uh, probably see now with purchase of a GitHub and in general, uh, you know, their positions now, uh, Microsoft is all in on, on supporting open source, right? Uh, how things can change in, uh, in uh, 20 years. Uh, we also have uh, a open source big exit with Sun acquiring MySQL for what looked at that time as a huge amount of money, the billion dollars, right? Which was uh, another recognition for open source software. Before that, uh, the only uh, successful open source company uh, at uh, that scale, which kind of survived a dot com bubble, was uh, was Red Hat, right? And it's always good to see uh, what uh, something is not just you know one time accident, but as a business model uh, can be successfully repeated. Of course, now billion dollars doesn't really surprise anyone, right? There are many uh, the, uh, open source and related companies which uh, fetch many billion dollars uh, uh, valuation, but at that time, wow, that was a big news. What also was happening at that time is what we see increasing amount of corporation understanding the value of the open source, the strategic value of uh, of an open source, right? And we still see uh, the uh, open source first approach starts to be forming, right? Both by enterprises and also some uh, governments, which uh, start to say, "Hey, you know what? Uh, it's going to be better for all of us if we uh, run on open source versus uh, uh, versus commercial uh, commercial software, right? Where uh, we are, uh, well, beholden to the commercial company and also which is uh, controlled, uh, well, in many cases, right, uh, by uh, the foreign entity, right, uh, or foreign government in terms of laws, policies, and so on and so forth. Now, if you look from the business standpoint, uh, the approach to open source was not romantic anymore, right? It's not just about, hey, you know what? The open source makes the ground, uh, grass grow greener. It is more about uh, their cost and efficiency. And if you look at this case, the open source for business lowers cost, short-term and long-term. Right, that is direct lower cost because open source software, they're uh, typically uh, lower cost than commercial uh, software. I am not saying zero cost because it is not, right? Because uh, while the source code, uh, uh, right, uh, open source software is free, right? And may, there may be not license to pay, uh, really running software and customizing that for your needs and so on and so forth, that is uh, not, free, not free, right? But cost often can be lower. Also for the years, we can see what the engineering, uh, engineers preferences and availability uh, was getting better and better for, for open source, right? You would uh, uh, find engineers preferring to work with open source software 
uh, rather than commercial. We also see a better productivity because if you can see the source code, you actually can uh, sell help much better, understand how software works much better and so on and so forth, which in the end means that you have uh, faster innovation, right? Then compared with uh, uh, open, so with proprietary software and also avoiding software uh, vendor locking, which is uh, which is a big uh, uh, thing for many businesses, especially those who have been there for a long time and they can understand how the licensing policies of a vendor can change, right? And often not to your customer's uh, 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 benefit you know it's like uh, uh, in the computing and computers everything gets uh, cheaper all the time right but only if there is enough uh, competition to uh, to support that so uh, this also changed how open source uh, was uh, uh, approached right as a lot of enterprises start to uh, look at value open source then we also see the new generation of the open source founders which are starting the companies as a businesses first not with uh, uh, romantic ideas about the uh, open source uh, you know changing the world uh, and not just for fun but really because that is a, a great uh, business right and uh, there is a uh, potential to build a company, a successful company, realize some value and so on and so forth. Uh, because of that, also a lot of those open, uh, new generation companies were venture funded. And with that means what you need to provide the high returns and relatively fast, right? Because venture funding does not go in the uh, companies which expect to, go, to grow, you know, three X or five years. Right, I mean, uh, venture capital typically expects at least, uh, you know, 10x return from you uh, in in a few years. So you really need to grow fast or fail fast if you can. What that came is uh, to the situation where first the attractive messaging of open source is realized because, uh, you know, everybody uh, in the business understands that open source is better. But at the same time, those needs to be merged uh, somehow with uh, foundational principles of building successful, uh, growing, scalable business, right? Like, hey, how we can build mon monopoly, avoid competition, commoditization, increase stickiness, have our anti-competitive modes and so on and so forth, right? All the stuff you can hear in a business school. And I think what is interesting here is what you can find what a lot of those really go a lot in the, uh, in the conflict with that traditional uh, romantic open source uh, software, uh, software values. What that also created is number of uh, business models, uh, right, which go around open source and often use open source for marketing, but not completely open source, you know, such as open core software, open source eventually, shared source licenses, open source compatible software, and uh, uh, so on and so forth, right? And with that, not quite mm, open source software, we have sort of both positive and negatives coming in, right? Because from a positive, we have a lot of investment going on in the uh, technology around uh, open source, right? And really we have a very high pace of innovation, right? I mean, especially the space I'm very close to the open source databases, it is actually phenomenal. So many companies are uh, doing uh, so much cool stuff now and at least part of that innovation is uh, is open source but also that's quite not quite open source software doesn't provide all the values truly open source software pro software provides and you need to mm, know that now in 2010s and later we have another important impact for open source software is raise of the um, Race of the cloud. The cloud uh, uh, was started in uh, 2000s, right? AWS was founded in 2006, right? But it is uh, 
uh, not until I think uh, 2010s that it really becomes de facto standard for running your systems and it's really it start to impact the open source um, in a big deal, right? And uh, that comes with challenges and opportunities for, uh, for open source uh, software. I think one thing which is very interesting what Cloud uh, broke, it allowed to hijack the GPL license, right? Before the cloud, the open source companies could use the GPL as, uh, uh, as we'll talk later, which is um, uh, the copyleft, right, or uh, restrictive uh, license, which uh, uh, really means if you want to base their commercial software, right, on, uh, on the GPL software, you can't really do that, right? You need to open source derived work. And that means uh, what, uh, if you want to do that, you'll come to copyright holder and ask them for another license, right? The uh, commercial uh, license and pay for that. For example, MySQL very successfully used their um, dual license model, right? To deal with that. Uh, but that is not required in the cloud, right? Amazon, uh, for example, is able to uh, have something like Amazon Aurora, which is uh, surely derived work of uh, MySQL, which Oracle works copyright on, without be required to pay to Oracle for that, right? So that's really uh, a shake to the core, at least some of the open source business model. Another thing which is interesting here is what we have a great uh, rebundling, right? Uh, previously, we would buy the hardware, where we buy it or lease the server in a data center. Uh, it was separate from a software. So software costs were very visible. If I am you know, buying uh, Oracle database to run, right? I see those costs separately and then we be a different budget. In case, oh, right, and then open source uh, comes with a uh, fantastic, uh, you know, price of uh, zero, right, at least to, uh, to get started. That is not the case in the cloud. In the cloud, you always pay for uh, usage, right, and whatever it is, uh, I don't say, uh, one dollar for uh, an hour, right, for your, uh, you know, just Linux box, right, or two dollars an hour when it runs some uh, proper database, uh, right? Well, it is uh, uh, much more hidden and there is no more zero price uh, effect, which is a powerful psychological effect, which draws how humans are attracted to free stuff, right? And I think that's one of the important drivers of the open source uh, success, right? now. As we come to the 2020s, uh, we come to the future and it is kind of difficult to make accurate predictions uh, about the futures as uh, some wise men uh, said. At the same time, I think it is uh, 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 interesting uh, to, uh, to see what there is a great momentum happening now for commercial open source software. I mentioned in the early on in this presentation what uh, the billion bucks, what the MySQL sold, uh, that uh, is not really uh, meaningful, right? Uh, those days, it's uh, right very, uh, you know, quite, uh, uh, quite, uh, quite small those days because there are many companies. In this case, these are in, you know, valued at the uh, in a, you know, many billions of dollars, right? Sometimes more or tens of billions of dollars. Another interesting thing, uh, which I think is uh, happening right now is what we have uh, pandemic, obviously. Uh, and uh, this is mm, uh, very interesting what uh, it has been causing the acceleration of uh, digital transformation in many cases at the same time as needs to cut the cost, right? Or at least uh, prevent them from going up uh, that quickly. And I think that was very good for uh, open source. 
just a few days ago, this interesting article came out on ZDNet, which I like the title of that, what open source goes up when economy, uh, economy goes down, right? Of course, we don't want the economy goes down or uh, uh, people uh, dying, right? As happens with the COVID-19, right? And other horrendous effects, but uh, uh, those things nasty uh, tend to also uh, speed up open source uh, adoption and especially in uh, unlikely places. And uh, I will uh, finish it up with my uh, belief, uh, right? What I think the trend which will continue is what no one uh, wants to be uh, a hostage. Nobody wants to be kind of subject to uh, vendor lock-in, right? Because uh, uh, even if it's not very painful short term, then that tends to be uh, more painful as the time goes uh, on, right? So you know, over long term increasing amount of uh, smart strategic thinkers, I will continue to be choosing the open source software. Okay, any thoughts, questions, disagreements on this section? Anyone? I don't see anything in chat or Q and A. Yeah, I think participants can uh, post their questions in three ways. You can use the chat, the Zoom chat feature, or you can use the Q and A feature, or you can raise your hands and I can unmute you to ask a question. And that was a great talk, Peter. Thank you, thank you for the wonderful talk. Okay, okay. Well, the talk is not ended yet. It's just the section. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it, it has one more part that's coming up in another uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, anyway, so uh, uh, as we review the history, I wanted to talk about the open source and, uh, and you, right? And uh, specifically, what your goals being involved with uh, open source are. Right, and I think that is uh, uh, important uh, before we go to a section and start uh, talking about choosing a business model and so on and so forth, because uh, your goals may not mm, require that. Right now, you may be involved with open source, you know, just for fun or to, to make a career. Right, I mean, open source uh, contributor, right, and especially being creator of some open source project, really can uh, be do wonders for your uh, uh, for your career even if you do not monetize it directly maybe you are building something to make a difference right and building a business uh, of your open source uh, uh, project is only one of the goals right you may have uh, also I think is a good question to uh, uh, ask uh, uh, in uh, in uh, in this case uh, is uh, uh, about uh, their um, uh, about what your goals with a, uh, with a project uh, oh, uh, is uh, wherever you are working Oops, sorry you know got distracted uh, reading in uh, the chat, not very good trying to multitask. Okay, so um, the other thing I would consider, right, if there's an existing project or you're thinking to uh, uh, to create one, right, uh, as I uh, uh, spoke in the historical section, right, when pe uh, there are people uh, in the first stages, they often would, you know, just create a project coming out of their needs, right? Uh, in uh, uh, in the modern age, some people say, "Hey, you know what? I think it would be great if for me to start the open source business. I'm just don't know about what, right? And then maybe I will do some market research to see the things which doesn't exist, and then only start uh, uh, open source project." Another thing I think which is uh, very good to consider is this kind of difference between the open source project and the open source 
uh, products, right? Some people use those terms interchangeably, but I think there is a very important difference uh, between those two. Because any code on a GitHub, GitLab, right, or wherever could be called the open source, you know, open source project, right, of course. What I think is interesting is what the many open source projects are, or at least can be focused on their developer, right, or developers. Right? Often you would talk to those guys and they will tell you, well, you know what, what I want from this open source project and do uh, X, Y, and Z. I am writing on those things because they are interesting for me. That is what I am choosing to support or do. And I don't really mm, uh, care so much about, mm, about users, right? Because that project is for me, I'm just sharing that and take it uh, or, or leave it, right? Again, not all open source projects are uh, this way, and actually many successful ones are not, right? But uh, as a project, uh, running a project as developer, you have a full right to be uh, uh, to be um, uh, selfish, right? Well, they also may not care so much about the documentation, compatibility, QA, and so on and so forth. Some developers just, you know, write to uh, write the code and hey, you know what? If that's a baby, they have all the documentation they need in their in their head. Their user and customer support also may be uh, miss uh, hit or miss, right? Again, some people are very passionate about uh, helping user to be successful. Other would say, well, you know what? If you can't figure it out, then you are stupid. Uh, too stupid to use my uh, product, so mm, go away. Now, if you are making a product commitment, right, then that means many of those change uh, have to change, at least if you want your product to be actually successful as a product, right? You need, for example, to have a very clear licenses, you know, just, hey, the stuff on a GitHub would not uh, cut it. You would need to make sure that the life cycle compatibility upgrade path is uh, uh, very clear as well, right? Because your users, uh, especially serious one, right? They're going to defy, uh, rely on that and many will make a commitment for uh, your product for uh, many years or even decades if they include that in their software. Many would also make sure you provide builds, packages, make your uh, project uh, accessible highways, maybe on some marketplaces and so on and so forth. Documentation becomes critical, right? You will have to find a way how you uh, support uh, the end users, right? Whether that is a free or commercial, you know, people will report bugs or have some problems they mm, need and so on and so forth. Uh, security issues, uh, remediation becomes uh, uh, very important, especially, you know, those days where we hear so many news about companies, you know, constantly being hacked, right? And at the same time, we really don't want to uh, be even used, right? And you probably also don't want to, to uh, want your product uh, being out there in the news as a reason you know, some huge company got hacked and I don't know, let's say bill, uh, millions, uh, billions, right? The user uh, passwords were released and so on and so forth, right? And you also, of course, need uh, to have a, you know, great quality assurance to support all of that. Okay, let's see. So the uh, yeah. So the question is about clear license about license of users sub uh, sub packages too. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, uh, that is something which you would uh, uh, you better have right, or it will uh, or the, especially for larger um, uh, customers, it will uh, 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 it will float uh, right uh, problem. Now, what is interesting also is. Uh, you may not uh, need that if you have a right to uh, relicense the code, right? Uh, 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 for example, if you uh, look at uh, MySQL, which is saying, hey, everything that there is MySQL server is GPL. In fact, it uh, includes inside uh, some of, uh, you know, uh, BSD and other uh, libraries which are compatible with GPN, uh, GPL in a sense, when the whole work 
can be uh, 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 can be uh, licensed as GPL. In other cases, like for example, if you look at the uh, you know Linux distributions uh, and others, you may often have different packages coming you know with different licenses, right? And in this case, uh, yes, you better to have that uh, that clear. Okay, uh, Peter, I think you have one more question in the Q and A section. The question is. Uh, what were the four business models uh, in the slide that you showed, like uh, uh, open source eventually and things like that? You showed a slide. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, well. So this is from yeah, Philip Conrad. He yes, wants to I see. Well, uh, thank you for flagging that uh, for me. So, uh, Philip, uh, I just uh, go to use that uh, very frequently, uh, quickly for historical review. Uh, in uh, in that case. Uh, but I will talk more specifically at the business model at the later session of this presentation, right? Including those four. Can you also flash that slide for a minute, uh, Peter? Maybe that's that could help him. Oh, that's a slide. Uh, I think that's a slide about business model that was quite a while ago. But again, okay. uh, we'll get we'll get to that, right? I'm not going to. Okay. Yeah. Scroll back to that again. Okay. So anyway. Uh, the main point uh, here I am uh, uh, looking to make is uh, what not every developer, right, really is interested in my experience in turning their open source project in uh, in a product, right? As you talk to them and explain them, many will find the task uh, daunting, right? And uh, uh, they're not interested in doing that themselves or uh, building a team you know, which does it uh, for them, right? Because as you're building an open source business, you don't have to do anything, right? That somebody has to, right? Uh, but I think it's uh, something else which is very interesting to consider here, right? Uh, you may choose not to focus on building a, uh, building a company and a product, right? Around your open source project, but also mind what if your uh, project going to be very successful, then somebody else will do that, right? So uh, interesting um, example for uh, in the open source database space would be uh, uh, would be Redis, right? There, uh, Salvatore San Felipe he you know for years didn't want really to build a big business a product around Redis that was you know wonderful, very much loved open source projects, right? Uh, then uh, you would see uh, Redis Labs and uh, some other companies uh, went ahead to build a business around it because, well, uh, there was uh, uh, was attraction and, uh, and, their, and their opportunities, right? Linux is uh, also another example, right? There, uh, uh, there are other companies build uh, a products uh, and big businesses around uh, Linux uh, where uh, Linux stores uh, choose not to do it, uh, uh, not to do it directly, right? And I think it turned out uh, pretty well, both for Linux and uh, uh, and Salvatore, right? Uh, in uh, in this case, uh, right? Uh, I uh, feel so it's uh, maybe you know different if they would uh, uh, run uh, their own business. So yeah, okay. With that, we are moving on to the open source mm, business models. And if it's a, a thing I wanted to to say, what uh, you should look at business model first and the license second because depending on what your business models are uh, you will uh, uh, need to see what license choices are going to be able to support uh, that uh, the face uh, i want to quote uh, this uh, man martin makers he was the uh, CEO of uh, uh, MySQL, uh, and uh, he's a CEO of uh, uh, HackerOne, uh, and I think he's one of his uh, great thought leaders uh, when it comes to the open source uh, um, monetization. 
And one uh, great quote you said is what the open source is not a business model. Then you say, well, if that is not the business model, then what open source is? Well, the open source can be seen as your development model, you know, distribution model, uh, right? But, uh, uh, and you can, of, uh, and many companies, of course, build models around or open source, but itself open source does not specifically prescribe you uh, any particular uh, business model. Now, what is also interesting is what you do not have to have uh, both open source development model and uh, the distribution model. You will find, of course, many, uh, many projects which really are successful because it is kind of a uh, whole community which builds them and contributes. You know, think about Linux or Postgres or Kubernetes and so on and so forth. But another company which I mentioned the slide as a very mm, successful one, uh, MongoDB, right, uh, is uh, using open source as distribution strategy, right, but not really as uh, development, right? This is a quote from their uh, CEO mm, interview, which uh, pretty much says, hey, you know what? MongoDB was built by MongoDB. We didn't uh, really intend to get any help from community. We just uh, look at that as a freemium strategy read. Well, open source is great for, mm, uh, for distribution. So let's look at those uh, things, what open source really provides, right? I think the value what open source provides which you cannot uh, uh, or do not get exactly the same way with um, the proprietary software. One is open source distribution model. Obviously, you uh, there are additional channels of distributing open source which are not as easy for commercial products, right? For example, there is a GitHub where a lot of people can find cool open source projects, right, and start using them. You can also potentially have your project uh, includes in the distributions, right? Uh, I think especially for in the earlier days, uh, uh, getting includes uh, that in one of the Linux distributions was absolutely, you know, a fantastic way to get uh, some good adoption traction for Linux uh, for your open source project. Uh, also, you could be distributed as a part of other projects. Right, you would often uh, see people taking the open source projects and including them in their open source project and for that driving more use and adoption for uh, your product. Of course, that's also possible with, uh, with a commercial software, but you would need to you know, negotiate the rights, sign the license, blah, blah, blah. So it's uh, you know, much more mm, uh, friction. If you look at open source development model, it also comes with a lot of uh, uh, value. If you look at uh, many successful open source uh, projects, they have fantastic code contributions, right? That means not just you, but somebody else is working. Okay, well, it looks like it's, uh, it's a time to continue. So uh, I ended the last uh, part by uh, talking about uh, if you look into and build a business, it's good to figure out what kind of business you really look at. And that may land somewhere between the, you know, two you know, opposites, uh, kind of bigger exit uh, versus uh, uh, looking to just build a uh, sort of lifestyle for yourself and uh, maybe a few friends. If you look at the uh, big exit, what that defines, that means that you'll have to have a you know, product uh, focused business, right? That means uh, what you are really creating IP around uh, the, uh, the software products, right? You are really building that anti-competitive modes, me, uh, right? Making sure what you are, uh, well, really uh, can provide something exclusively, right? The customers, what uh, your competition cannot be, you really need to obsess with scaling, you know, thinking how a company can uh, go for, you know, from 
you know, no revenue to million, 10 million, 100 million revenue and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and what that means is uh, uh, open so uh, raising uh, capital, right? Venture capital uh, is uh, uh, very often uh, required uh, in uh, in this case. Like for example, all the companies on the list uh, I mentioned, they ended up raising a lot of tens and hundreds of millions of uh, venture uh, capital. And what uh, happens also in this case is what. Uh, open source also takes a, takes a backseat, right? Because in this case, this is a business first, right? And the fact it is built around open source is second, right? And that is, I think, the last piece is why you would see some of the open source project founders didn't want to fully jump on that kind of VC trail with their project because uh, in this case, uh, they felt what they will be have to be focus too much mm, on uh, making money and not as much uh, about uh, making a difference and providing the value for project users, right? If that is more of a lifestyle business, then uh, that can be service business uh, or it can be service product too, right? In this case, you will have a pressure. You can proceed on your own pace and uh, on your own terms. Mm, it is uh, easy to focus uh, uh, on the open source in this case, right? You can find many of the smaller businesses can say, hey, you know what? We are uh, contributing 100% of, uh, 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 like of our stuff as an open source at some very uh, permissive license. And we are essentially doing some sort of, um, uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, consulting. Right, and it's also a lot easier to to bootstrap, right? Like in this case, uh, because uh, you can often start service revenue by just doing it yourself. Often you can even start by doing that all part time while holding to your kind of main uh, main job, right? And that doesn't require a lot of uh, capital, right? Uh, one thing I think it's uh, very interesting when it comes to open source uh, business built around open source is those concepts of uh, distribution and uh, monetization, right? If you think about the distribution focus, right? This is something about how can we grow the number of users of your open source software as quickly as possible. And then monetization focus is okay how can we get as many of those users to become customers right and paying customers right what i mean, what i mean in this case and also increasing amount of each side such customers pay right so and uh, those two they really uh, come uh, in a conflict Right, like uh, for example, you can think about Amazon RES as saying, "Hey, that thing is uh, great for growing number of MySQL users, but that is not so great for Oracle trying to monetize MySQL because, well, Amazon is monetizing them in this case, not uh, not Oracle." What is also that means interesting is that is how many many open source uh, projects they sort of change in their evolution, right? Like uh, for example. Uh, if you look in a database space, you can take a look at the MongoDB as this uh, very sort of quintessential example. When they started, all the features were open source under the GPL license, right? And it looked like uh, uh, what everything is um, is going to be. But then after MongoDB uh, reached critical mass, uh, then uh, uh, they uh, shifted. Uh, uh, adding some features as enterprise only features, right, in the commercial software. And then later on, uh, abandoning open source license altogether and going to source available uh, license to increase monetization and to uh, protect uh, their turf, right, from, uh, from competition, right? Uh, because at that point, that was more important uh, than uh, getting as much growth as possible. Right, and uh, if they would start the same way, 
as we are uh, right now, chances are they wouldn't be mm, uh, able to get uh, uh, the same uh, traction as quickly. And you can see that repeated by many, many smaller uh, organizations as well. Okay, so let us uh, look at the open source business models, right? And I will uh, talk about those uh, uh, business models in a little bit different words, right? And I mentioned like an open source, source available, right? Because that was kind of business model more classified by what kind of license uh, you use, right? And this is not complete list of uh, business models for open source uh, software, right? You can uh, uh, check the Wikipedia link, uh, for example, uh, uh, to find probably about 10 more, more exotic models. And I don't think even Wikipedia is complete here. But, uh, you know, if you are really looking at, uh, at the business, you would uh, uh, look at uh, uh, probably something uh, along those. Right. Now, what is also mm, good to point out here is what not all, uh, it is not about picking one of the open source uh, of those models. Uh, you may actually be uh, having multiple uh, models at the same time, right? I know, uh, uh, I know Pircona does. So, uh, it is not single choice, but more of a multiple choice uh, answer. Though typically most companies will choose to focus on one or maybe you know two different business models uh, the most. Okay, so if you think about the services, such as a consultant or, or customer engineering, right, also referred uh, as as you know sponsored features, sometimes it is relatively easy um, uh, to get to, right? Like uh, as a mentioned that if you have a services model that's open, you can just do it yourself part-time first until you get enough business to um, uh, get more more people, right? If that's uh, how you choose to start. The challenge in that is what uh, the margin is relatively low, right? In terms of what's, uh, if it is uh, sort of like, uh, you know, con uh, consulting, right? For example, typically there are sort of, uh, you know, prevailing, uh, market rates, right? And people are not going to, uh, uh, you know, pay you, you know, too much more uh, than that, right? So the difference is between how much you can essentially war make as uh, would have to pay to somebody to um, to work for you, right? And how much you can charge your customers, but that difference is not, uh, the difference is not huge. Uh, that revenue is also not recurring, right? That means what you'll often have to invest a lot of times in marketing and sales to get those uh, uh, those projects. You know, sometimes you may get lucky and uh, uh, land some, you know, long-term consulting project for, uh, uh, for yourself, but those things are, again, harder, uh, uh, hard to scale, right? If you have a team of people ensuring all of them are staffed on a long-term project uh, is a is not easy. Uh, and, uh, and the fact is hard to scale, right? Because if consulting, you scale by delivering hours, right? Or, or building the code, uh, you have to uh, hire a lot of, uh, you know, bright engineers to do that, which is, uh, mm, uh, which is tough. The next model is around support at uh, managed services is, uh, uh, is uh, a little bit different, right? And uh, it's worth to note what some people have consulting and essentially call that support and managed services. Saying, hey, well, uh, you know what? If you have a problem, you can call us and we'll charge you for, you know, two hours or how, how long it, it uh, took us to figure out the problem. And that's it, right? That is not what I call uh, support here. What I call support or managed services is when you have a, a subscription, right? You charge uh, folks so many, uh, you know, dollars per instance, per CPU, right? Or whatever model is uh, per year, right? And then they mm, uh, reach you out when you have a problem or, or, or something like that. Uh, in this case, that creates you predictable recurring revenue, which is very important for growing the company. 
generally, it gives a better margin, uh, especially for uh, support. It's um, also uh, easier uh, to scale uh, in this case, because after you build out the team to cover Mm, let's say 24 uh, by seven, while you need more engineers, as you get more customers, uh, it's not uh, the same kind of proportional way as uh, uh, it uh, happens if, uh, you know, pure consulting services. And it also requires medium investment to start. You probably cannot really provide a good 24 by seven support, but, you know, just being one person working part-time, right? You would uh, need a team uh, to uh, really be able to answer your questions you know, of your customers 24 by 7, but that is uh, typically, you know, a uh, smaller team compared to what you would need to really, you know, do some massive uh, software build. Now, dual licenses, mm, dual license, that is the next business model, which is a uh, uh, product based. And it generally talks about selling commercial license version of a product for those who cannot comply with terms of open source license, right? In its pure form, dual license doesn't mean that there is a feature differentiation, right? It's, it simply says, hey, you know what? The same product, same features exactly, but only available open source and not open source for those who cannot apply um, uh, with that license. Like MySQL uh, used, to, uh, uh, used to do that, for example. And that is different from a model, which what I will call uh, enhanced commercial version, right? Which is uh, the, uh, this model often kind of uh, became connect, uh, evolved to become connected to uh, uh, those days, where you would have a community version, and then you also have uh, more advanced uh, enterprise version, right, as it's uh, often called. And that uh, version is uh, available on the commercial, uh, under the commercial uh, license, right? So you both have a dual license, commercial uh, and open source, but you have also different features which are available under proprietary um, options, right? So. In this case, you have enhanced commercial version uh, of uh, uh, product uh, and so, uh, sold, right? And that's traditionally packaged with uh, additional benefits such as you know, support, uh, support subscription, right? Uh, this uh, business model, dual alliance and enhanced commercial version, they typically get uh, require even, mm, uh, the, even more investment because as you start, selling the, uh, the software, there are uh, many things in play in terms of people uh, start to expect all things I mentioned about, you know, like security remediation, um, uh, right, packages and so on and so forth, right, which uh, tend to uh, require a team to maintain. And that is uh, in general, right? You can see here some founder stories which can say, hey, you know what, I just, you know, started selling my commercial version of my product, right? And that's how I uh, uh, made my money, uh, right? My first money. And I think that's workable in uh, more of a kind of a B2C industries when a product is not as business critical, right? For example, you have, uh, I don't know, let's say some uh, open source developer tool, right? Or, or, or something else. Uh, often you can do it as a, uh, as a single developer, uh, right? Uh, because there is not expectation of business critical 24 by seven support. In market where I come from, when it comes to mission critical databases, if people buy your software, they also expect all the you know, mission critical support, which comes with that, which uh, requires uh, a lot more investment. The next model for open source is uh, uh, SaaS. When you can say, hey, there is an open source software which exists out there, and there is a SaaS version of that software which is commercially uh, available, right? Uh, the great example of that would be, for example, um, uh, WordPress, right? Where you can download and install WordPress as completely open source, or you can also get 
uh, SaaS deployment from uh, war, WordPress.com. In this case, it is typically paired with a freemium model, all right, where you can, uh, you know, try things out for free, all right, in the cloud, and then uh, later on you become, mm, uh, you know, uh, paying customer. The same applies in the uh, mm, uh, to the database space, right? You would uh, uh, see the database as a service being a very popular way to deploy databases right now, right? Being that Amazon or others. Right, and also typically would have some sort of like a, uh, you know, free tier or free tier, uh, free triggers, uh, uh, free or something to try it out. Now, what is also interesting in this case is, uh, in most cases, SaaS version is not mm, hundred percent open source, right? Even if it, the end user product features are completely are. There, there is likely to be like proprietary interface to the uh, kind of deploy that. Maybe there's like a proprietary backplane, how it's been managed, uh, and uh, and so on and so forth, right? And uh, that is a uh, uh, reality, and uh, that I think has been pretty well accepted, uh, you know, by the users, right? Because I don't think what's uh, um, uh, uh, there have been a lot of services which would really open source everything. So you can just go ahead and build exact clone of what they are doing and compete with them uh, right there uh, while they um, uh, care all costs. Well, and uh, uh, also uh, the next one is uh, um, advertisement support software, right? Where uh, software includes an ads directly or um, indirectly right uh, maybe there's let's say some functionality to remove ads uh, if you uh, if you you know pay for software something like uh, like that that may be direct ads or may not be like for example if you think about the uh, mozilla firefox right one of the very successful uh, open source um, uh, projects right for uh, for years uh, it was always getting a lot of uh, revenue from affiliate uh, search partners, right? So when you search in Firefox, you don't necessarily see a lot of ads from Firefox itself, but uh, uh, the search partners essentially, uh, well, share revenue, right, through, uh, through Firefox. And uh, as I mentioned, this is a multiple choice uh, Mm, yeah, choice uh, answer. Uh, another thing uh, which you want to think about the uh, business model is uh, what is going to be your uh, go to market, right? One is selling to the end user, which typically means there is large volume of a small, medium sized deals. And that often allows to for an expensive and quick sales process often uh, based around their uh, uh, e-commerce, right? You would uh, hear about some companies, at least at the at the uh, at the very beginning, say, "Hey, we don't have anybody in sales at all, right? We'll just um, uh, have an online forum for people to um, to buy what we have to sell, right?" And that is one very good model and it's also good because you don't have to hire the enterprise selling folks the sales folks which are uh, very expensive and i would say for a lot of uh, open source uh, developers themselves while they may be good at writing the code and even providing the end user support probably they would not uh, be very good doing enterprise selling dealing with all that you know mountains of paperwork which required in, in uh, this case and so on and so forth right at least i know for me in the early days really dealing with that sales process that was uh, uh one of the uh things i liked the least uh even though um, what was like 15 years ago right when i uh did that uh, the enterprise selling process was easier uh, than uh, it is now. The other thing that you have to think about, or it's maybe given in your product, is the ownership of uh, governance, 
right? Uh, and you can see what uh, there are uh, diff uh, different uh, things in uh, this case, and there are many open source projects and related products in both camps, right? If you think about the community foundation governed products, right? Linux, PostgreSQL, Kubernetes, Drupal, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, you would often see uh, multiple companies offering some sort of commercial distribution, right? Or otherwise offering around the product, uh, right? And uh, many companies to participate in development and so on and so forth. Or you can have a governance where single company governance product like MySQL, MongoDB, Nginx, and many others. And then other companies may be able to contribute that, but that's you know typically the future of a of a product is defined by the single uh, uh, by the single uh, company. Uh, and again, if you are looking at existing products, well, you just have to figure out in what camp it is. If you are thinking about what to do with your product, you uh, you have a kind of two cho choices, right? Is as a company owned open source, or you can try to get the product uh, uh, to be included in one of, um, you know, uh, independent, so let's say foundation, and then uh, build your product around that, right? Like for example, if you think uh, about uh, Cassandra, right, or uh, Hadoop, they are open source. Uh, uh, they are also like community foundation products, right? Even though uh, there are companies like Cloudera or DataStax, which really build the business around them. And at that time, there was, uh, I think, decision what uh, having that as a uh, foundation driven makes it better for uh, for for distribution right and for growth right which as i mentioned growth and monetization those are kind of two things that you have to always balance okay let's move on uh, to the uh, last topic of this discussion unless you folks have some questions you know check in nothing in q a nobody in in chat, it seems like it. Okay, cool. Then I'll just continue and uh, uh, you know ask if you have a, a so let's talk about licenses for open source and maybe not quite uh, open source software. The first, I'll have to give you um, a warning: what I am not uh, a lawyer, right? This is uh, my understanding, you know. Don't think that's as a legal advice. And obviously, uh, uh, most likely I will have something wrong, right? And butcher some terms or something like that. So if there are some uh, lawyers on this call, please uh, uh, forgive me uh, for that. If you look at the open source, uh, as I mentioned briefly, there is, you can think about kind of two types of open source, right? There is an open source in substance and there is using open source for, uh, for marketing, right, and then build the models which are uh, really focused at the, uh, uh, you know, selling commercial open source software around that. If you look at the truly open source, uh, it's, um, it's not like a registered trademark, right, uh, as some other terms uh, we deal in everyday basics with. So there is not just one uh, uh, the definition. Uh, if you think about free and open source software, I think those are three uh, most important sources, right? There is an OSI, Open Source Initiative, there is a GNU, which defines uh, free software, and there is also Debian, the used term of uh, Debian free and open source software, right? But uh, generally, if your software is compliant with, uh, with those, right, you would consider that uh, open source. Open source initiative, right? Uh, they are mm, uh, uh, kind of uh, can uh, uh, have a, a issue judgment, right? Wherever given license is uh, open source uh, or not, but that has a value of, I would say, like a community pressure, most and foremost, right? It's not like you can, you know, get sued, right? If you say, oh, uh, my software is open source, but it's not licensed on OSI approved. Uh, license. Like I, when it comes to the 
uh, open source and free software. And sorry, I will use the terms interchangeably in this case, right? Even if, you know, people who are really from one or other camps may really want to highlight the difference in the emphasis. Uh, I like free software uh, definition because it's so damn simple. It really uh, talks about the uh, software freedom and those kind of four uh, essentially uh, uh, essential freedoms, right? Which uh, uh, which it uh, provides. So when I speak about the open source business. I think uh, I mentioned this with the monetizing uh, truly open source software and is hard, right? And even if it's not uh, there, uh, uh, you know, just open source, uh, right? If you have some additional uh, software, traditionally you will have only single digit uh, of percent of your users actually being monetized, actually paying for software while other is just using that. I think with cloud that is a, a, a kind of going to change and more users are going to pay for using for running open source software in the cloud in the cloud where that is to the uh, open source software copyright holder right or somebody else that's another story right like uh, as I mentioned Amazon they are making uh, more money on MySQL in the cloud than um, Oracle, right? I don't know uh, details, but I would be surprised if that's less than the order of magnitude uh, uh, difference. So you often um, are faced with this uh, choice or on the uh, license uh, choices, right? Uh, between the ease of uh, distribution right, and growth, right, that's often comes with a permissive open source licenses to maximizing monetization, right, which gets hard, uh, easier as you go from uh, permissive licenses to, you know, proprietary software, where obviously you have opportunity to mo monetize every single user of your software by charging them, but uh, that often does not uh, create as much uh, di distribution. If you look at the two big licenses in the open source license classes, that would be permissive and copyleft, right? What is uh, the key difference? The permissive licenses, that means what uh, somebody can modify the software, create derived work, and do whatever you want with the results, including license it commercially. Like, PostgreSQL is a is very good example here, again, in the uh, open source database space from which I come from, right? There, uh, there are a lot, a lot of uh, commercial PostgreSQL derived uh, distributions, right? Because uh, uh, they can. Copyleft, that needs, means you can modify software, but you need to distribute all the changes under the save license, right? So for example, with MySQL, there are not, uh, not many uh, commercial uh, derived products, right? Some people can play a little bit kind of games with GPL saying, oh, you know what, uh, uh, we are uh, shipping you kind of some other components which are commercial, right? And uh, right, packaging that together as commercial only option, but it's not the same as uh, with, uh, Postgres. And, but I, as I mentioned, uh, in the modern world, where often we do not ship software, but just run it in the cloud, this kind of uh, breaks because uh, the copyleft software uh, license, what MySQL used, did not prevent from uh, Amazon mm, hijacking that. And I think you need to consider uh, with the license is uh, if you, when you're building a product, uh, it may be belong to one of the sort of an ecosystem rather than creating your own. And all those different ecosystems have a preference for their licenses, right? So for example, stuff around Linux is based about G around GPL. So in that um, community, right, building extensions or whatever, GPL is very acceptable license. Kubernetes runs on Apache to the O license, PostgreSQL is PostgreSQL license, right? And at least for the open source parts of your product, right? Project. And again, in many cases, you would, uh, uh, for your business model, choose to have 
the open source and the proprietary parts, it's often a good idea to uh, use the license which is adopted by the community, right? If that fits for you uh, to avoid uh, extra uh, uh, friction. When you think about the business model and the license, you have to figure out what I will call that uh, license model fit, right? So you really need to make sure uh, what the license or licenses you choose really choose uh, 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 fit your uh, model. And again, let's go through their uh, license models we spoke about and see uh, how they fit to the different models. If you look at, at the consulting and custom engineering, permissive licenses uh, uh, work great because a lot of people use your software, all right? And uh, you get a lot of adoption and that gets more uh, business, right? And also if you are in the consulting and custom engineering space, your public cloud SaaS is not a major competition, right? Frankly, if you are uh, in the business of doing consulting and Amazon decided to package your product and run it in the cloud. Oh, that is fantastic. That means there will be a lot of business for you um, now uh, on Amazon and we will be very happy to work as a partner with you and send you some consulting business most likely. If you are thinking about um, support and managed services, that can work with a variety of licenses, but in this case, you're starting to uh, uh, think about the competition from a hyperscale cloud providers, right? Because uh, if uh, Amazon uh, uh, runs, uh, let's say, Postgres or Redis or whatever, we say, hey, we got you covered. You don't kind of need support and we are providing you fully managed services, right? So uh, in this case, you, uh, while it can work with uh, any license, often figuring out how to uh, protect it uh, starts to be uh, making sense. The problem is uh, what uh, conventional copyleft licenses, they haven't been very uh, very good in kind of deterring Amazon from uh, doing what they are doing. Uh, and that's uh, forced a lot of product for the projects for those that uh, this is important to either use uh, 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 source available licenses, right? Or ship some components at least as a commercial altogether, right? If you are uh, employing the dual licenses business model, then this license really relies on open source license limitations, right? It's, you wouldn't get a lot of the license if you license everything under like BSD license, right? For example, because somebody can already take it and uh, run it for free uh, and you know do derived work for free, right? So in this case, uh, you are uh, looking at copyleft and source available licenses, especially uh, if, you, uh, if your product is of a nature uh, what the competition with cloud vendors may um, uh, exist. Now for enhanced commercial, commercial version, uh, that is where you often have a different, um, uh, uh, many different choices, right? And that an enhanced commercial version also uh, may mean different things. You know, in uh, some cases you would have your open source version, which is kind of very uh, full featured, right? And in this case, you may want to have more protection from that, uh, from that right? So uh, let's say, you know, uh, people cannot just take uh, too much of that stuff from you. If your uh, version, uh, open source version is uh, uh, much more crippled, then in this case, well, mm, uh, you may not need that. In some cases, I've seen people would uh, have a, a relatively limited open source version, like for example, if no high ability or, you know, like a reduced scaling on and so on and so forth available under completely, you know, permissive license, but there is a lot of a very important stuff in a, a enhanced commercial version, right? Which it creates enough of uh, uh, a differentiation. When it comes to, to SaaS, mm, uh, in practice, to prevent competition from uh, hyperscalers, source available licenses are often used. But that also, I think, applies to products which uh, got uh, a lot of traction and which are really this, you know, VC uh, 
uh, funded uh, product right which are looking for uh, many billion dollars of uh, of valuation right and um, for me it was kind of very interesting to see is how uh, for example amazon rds was received by uh, uh something like a mongodb and postgresql communities right where mongodb is like oh my gosh we really need to prevent the competition so we have it on uh, you know we get all the revenue capture where from postgresql community we can say oh great now so many people can will be exposed to a postgresql and run it great job amazon we love what you're doing that you know i support it in generally can work with uh, with any license i think what uh, you just need to be uh, mindful in this case, right? Because if you become too mean, then people can exercise their kind of right to fork and uh, ship the packages with your uh, ads uh, removed, uh, right? Uh, uh, so uh, I would say be careful of that. Uh, one interesting trend that I would want to know just is if you see for open source software, and again, this doesn't talk about the proprietary, um, uh, like enhanced versions, right, and so on and so forth, we can see what the permissive licenses were gaining momentum, like every year since uh, 2012 and actually even uh, before that, right? So, uh, well, uh, because I think that's, uh, really helps uh, uh, helps adoption. And then when people ask me about MySQL and Postgres, I'll say, hey, that is one of the reasons what PostgreSQL is choose in many embedded environments, right? For example, if you think about like a, you know, GitLab or Atlassian of this world, it much, makes much more sense for them to uh, include Postgres because they can ha uh, have it very easily uh, 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 relicensed in the whole package and the property license and they need, which they just wouldn't be able to do with MySQL. Another interesting trend is obviously rise of source available license, right? At least in, uh, in database uh, space, you can see uh, because of that fear of a cloud, a lot of companies are moving at least some of their so software under source available licenses to prevent uh, that kind of uh, 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 competition. Now, a few more things uh, I uh, think you need to think about when you are um, uh, thinking about the license to choose your product. One is combination. How do you expect your software to be combined with open source uh, software, right, and proprietary software by uh, by users, right, which can drive your uh, your license choices, right? Uh, and often it can be different parts. For example, while uh, I mentioned MongoDB even went uh, away from uh, software open source license to source available license for the server side, for connectors, they went with a very uh, liberal permissive license because they want uh, everybody being able to include connectors to any software with uh, no questions asked. Uh, right to reduce that uh, uh, friction. Marketplaces, that is another uh, interesting thing which you have to be aware. In, in many cases, especially with certain kinds of open source software, people start to consume that from various marketplaces, right? Being that uh, uh, Apple App Store, Google Play, the Amazon Marketplace, and so on and so forth. Many of those marketplaces do not uh, allow uh, all uh, licenses. For example, you will see what the AGPL is not uh, allowed by many license, many of them. And um, uh, Apple apps, apps uh, Store doesn't even allow uh, GPL as far as I uh, uh, as I uh, understand. Or oh, actually, GPL conflicts with the terms, right? What are, uh, are placed by the uh, App Store, right? Sorry for interrupting. We only have five minutes left. Okay. Yes, we have another five slides left too. Okay. So the next uh, thing to consider is uh, the license and the copyright. And I have seen many mm, developers, right, especially with no legal background, not understanding that until it's kind of too too late, uh, right? 
So if you are, have a copyright for all the code in your project, then you can change the license uh, at any time for a new version of software, right? You don't, uh, if your license is not working out for you, you can change it, right? Uh, and uh, other people who just have a license to your product, but don't have a full copyright on it, they, uh, they cannot do that. Like for example, at Percona, we ship enhanced version of MySQL called Percona server for MySQL, right? But because we inherit a lot of code and the GPL license from MySQL or, like, or Oracle, and we don't have a copyright for that, we have no choice but only to ship that under uh, PostgreSQL of GPL or GPL uh, compatible license. What that means is if you are a developer having your product, make sure for accepting the contributions to your product, uh, get the, uh, the license grant to you for some contributors agreement to accept them under some very permissive license. So you can change the license later on if, you, if that's what is important to you. Because otherwise you may need to ch uh, chase, you know, 100 contributors you got over the last few years and ask them to change the license, which is tough. Another thing to consider is open source and trademark. These are mm, uh, different, right? Many open source software does not really give people permission to use uh, uh, the trademark, right? And that is something what you need to uh, think through. Many open source companies would publish their trademark policies separately from the license, and that may be more or uh, less uh, clear. Some of the newer open source licenses, they also talk um, uh, about this. Open source and patents, right? That is another thing you would need to uh, consider, right? For, you know, software patents is uh, a big deal. Somebody can get into trouble uh, for, right? So uh, uh, the, the open source license may or may not uh, include a patent uh, grant in them. So mm, uh, check that. Typically the users, especially enterprise ones, they do care uh, about patents. They want to make sure they're not going to get into you know, patent violation by using your uh, software. Well, and uh, uh, another thing I wanted to highlight is uh, if you uh, look at the license and say, well, you know what, open source license, I understand all of that, but we, re we need more protection from those, you know, pesky cloud vendors or somebody else. I would recommend it to check out this Polyform project, which is uh, uh, the new development, which is a collection of uh, not open source licenses, but relatively simple licenses for different use cases, right? And I wish more of the products would use those licenses, right? Because it would be uh, easier for users to understand uh, uh, the restrictions, right? Uh, compared to um, having those, you know, the huge number of a different shared source license which have been created over the last few years. So with that, uh, here is a summary of what we, uh, we spoke about today, right? In terms of your building the business around your open source, choosing license and business model. I would encourage you to decide on your goals versus the open source uh, project you have. You know, pick your uh, business goals to reach uh, those goals and then pick open source licenses, right? Or not only open source licenses to support that. And as you do that, I would encourage you to continue to contribute into open source as much as you can. And in fact, that's all I have. Thank you. Oh, yeah. We just had one comment. Uh, perhaps important to remember many open source contributors I know will refuse to contribute to any project with a CLA as they prefer to keep copyright over their own contributions. Well, uh, yes, that is, a, uh, that is a good point, right? And that is a balance, uh, uh, balance to hit, right? I would say there are, uh, uh, with uh, uh, with a uh, uh, with a C uh, with a CLA, right? Um, uh, I have seen both those things uh, creating a lot of friction and also you know working quite well. 
in uh, in other uh, cases. And also CLA is uh, can be different, right? In some cases, CLA just uh, means you're sort of like selling your unborn, uh, unborn children. In other cases, CLA can actually mean uh, things as a shared copyright, saying, hey, you know what? I, as a developer, yeah, I give you give it to open source project to copyright so you can do whatever you want with it. But also uh, for, for my code, right? I can do whatever with that, uh, with, uh, with that as well. Awesome. So thank you very much for, for your opportunity uh, for attending today. And the next session will begin at 1 p.m. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, I would uh, I would truly pass the slides to organizers, and I would expect they will be available uh, as they have been for uh, last conference, last conferences. So yeah, thank you all, folks, for attending.